Welcome, everyone, to the, the Great Hall tonight at uh, Armstrong Hall in the College of Law. My name is Jason Robert. I'm the director of the Lincoln Center for Applied Ethics and the director of the Arizona Bioethics Network. And this event this evening is a jointly sponsored event, uh, sponsored by those two uh, institutions. I am very grateful uh, to see so many faces in the room. I mean, this is one of those rooms that 40 people fit in kind of comfortably, 400 fit really well, uh, but it's nice to see uh, that it's not, there aren't any empty rows, and I'm grateful uh, for that. Uh, what we've got tonight is an opportunity for a bit of a, a public discussion on a complex topic. Um, my attitude toward applied ethics is that, that that's really what we ought to be trying to accomplish, civilized public conversations about complex social topics. And uh, we couldn't have a better group of folks tonight to help us uh, initiate that conversation. Um, what we've got for you is uh, two invited guests from out of state and two faculty members here at the university. And between the four of them, uh, they're going to have, I hope, a very animated and lively discussion. We've also got a microphone set up for anybody who wants to ask a question. And uh, we'll go until, I don't know, maybe 2 AM, 3 AM, whenever, whenever we're about done. So I'm going to start off with a couple of introductions. Helene Starks is sitting over here. Helene is uh, a PhD, and she's an associate professor in bioethics and humanities at the University of Washington Medical School in Seattle. She's also director of the Metrics Quality and Evaluation Program, or the Metrics Quality and Evaluation Core of the uh, University of Washington Palliative Care Center of Excellence. She's worked on advanced care planning and medical decision making at the end of life for over 25 years, ever since she was a tween. And uh, we're grateful to have her here. She was also an investigator on, I think, maybe the only longitudinal qualitative study of uh, patients and families uh, 35 families in this case, who pursued physician-assisted dying in order to get a sense of what they're actually going through and what they're predicting that they're going to go through over the course of uh, end-of-life planning. And most recently, Dr. Starks served as an expert witness in the recent British Columbia uh, court case, the uh, Carter v. Canada case, uh, over physician-assisted death in, uh, uh, in our neighbor to the north. So, Helene Starks. Our second, our second guest is Dr. Courtney Campbell, uh, who's also a PhD, and he is the Hunder, Hundir, Hunder, I've got it right, Hunder Professor of Religion and Culture and the Director of the Program in Medical Humanities at Oregon State University in Corvallis. He served on the Oregon Hospice Association Physician Assisted Death Task Force and is currently chair of the Benton Hospice Service Ethics Committee and co-chair of the Good Samaritan Regional Medical Center Ethics Committee in Corvallis. Uh, he's also a member of the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization's Physician Assisted Death Ethics Task Force as they consider whether to revise their position statement on physician assisted death. So welcome, Dr. Campbell. So sometimes a, a discussion like this would, would start off with a pro side and a con side. And I'll challenge you at the end of the evening to identify who's pro and who's con of the folks we've got here. These are some of the most talented and thoughtful uh, folks reflecting on the ethics of physician-assisted death and on the practice of physician-assisted death as it's uh, manifested in the US in the four states in which it has been uh, deemed not illegal or legal, depending on the state. We have as our interlocutors tonight two of my favorite people. Uh, Jenny Bryan on the left-hand side is a faculty fellow, sorry, on your right, uh, is a faculty fellow in, the, uh, in Barrett, the Honors College at Arizona State University. Uh, Jenny completed her PhD in biology, in bioethics, policy, and law in 2012 and uh, then served as a, an assistant professor of bioethics at the Asian University for Women in Bangladesh before coming back to ASU to pursue uh, this uh, tenure, well, not tenure, this uh, permanent position in the Honors College. Jenny's work focuses primarily on applied ethics and, um, and bioethics and business ethics, and uh, we're grateful that she's here. Alongside her, Mark Clark. Uh, Mark is a visiting scholar in applied ethics in the Lincoln Center for Applied Ethics. He's also a uh, uh, faculty in residence in uh, Manzanita Hall as part of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences uh, faculty 
fellow in residence program. Basically, it's an effort for us to try to, to uh, decrease the gaps, the, decrease the size of the gaps uh, between the classroom and everyday experiences for our undergraduate students. And Mark is our first, uh, our you know, uh, patient zero uh, in, our, uh, in our exercise here. We've been very grateful to have Mark. He just joined us recently from the University of Galveston, University of Texas Medical Branch, Galveston. And uh, I want to thank a couple of other folks who helped put this together. So you got some handouts as you walked in. The handouts were prepared um, on the basis of some background research conducted by three students uh, um, in the MA in Applied Ethics and the Professions program uh, and brought together in final form by Julie Leonard, one of our MA students. The other students are Paula Anibaba and uh, Kiong Lee, who are both up there as well. Mary Drago put together all the logistics for the event, and we're grateful to uh, the video producers from, uh, from ASU who are helping us uh, videotape the event tonight so that we can uh, replay it uh, for hopefully a broader audience in the future, but the quality of the video is gonna depend very heavily on the quality of the interaction and you know the AV stuff, but the quality of interaction uh, between the audience and our panel uh, on, the, on my right and our interlocutors over here. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to Mark and Jenny to run the show and uh, good luck. We're starting with uh, Dr. Campbell first. So. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, uh, Jason, for the opportunity to be here at um, this very prestigious campus, uh, Pac-12 rival of Oregon State University. Um, I've my dot, uh, my uh, oldest. Uh, Sister went to school here, and uh, but she never invited me down at this time of year when I really would have liked to come down. Um, so I'm delighted to be here. Um, uh, the, the question before us tonight, or at least one of the questions, is um, something along the lines of should Arizonans have av available to them, should terminally ill Arizonans have available to them physician-assisted death or physician aid in dying? You have some very good uh, handouts um, regarding what this might mean in terms of a law that might be passed, some of the provisions of that law, which is largely modeled on uh, what was passed in the, by voters in the state of Oregon in 1994. There was a court, uh, series of court hearings, so it really didn't become effective until October 1997. And then subsequently uh, passed by voter referendum in the state of Washington in 2008. Um, should that be available in this state? Uh, well, um, as a way of trying to get us to think about that question, I'm going to report, if you will, some of the arguments that were presented against the passage of the Oregon Death with Dignity Act. Okay, some of these I happen to agree with, others um, I didn't. Uh, but I just want to uh, uh, indicate the different ways arguments moved in both public discourse, professional discourse, to some extent academic discourse, when this was a very live issue in the state of Oregon, uh, pardon the pun there, um, but in, from 1994, uh, especially during, during that year. Um, uh, just as a little bit of very short background, because uh, we'll have some other discussion about what had gone on in Washington, but Oregon was the third state in a series of states on the west, west coast uh, that uh, engaged in citizen or voter referendums on uh, what came to be known as death with dignity or of physician-assisted death acts. Uh, Washington's initiative was first. It failed for reasons that will be described later. Then California. Um, and then, having learned some lessons from those two failures in 1991 and 1992, advocates uh, for death with dignity came to uh, the Oregon Death with Dignity Coalition, came and said, we have a way that we think will be successful in the public forum. And so, uh, uh, gave, were able to garner enough signatures um, to get it on the ballot. This would not have ever uh, passed had it gone through the legislature, legislative process. Um, uh, but we do have a voter referendum process. It made it onto the ballot and then uh, was successful on the um, 
uh, in November 1994 by 51 to 49% um, margin. Uh, now, what were the arguments that were raised against passing a statute similar to the one that's described on your handout uh, prior to uh, November 1994? Well, one argument that uh, surfaced, although uh, was more often uh, a horse to beat with by the opposition, was an argument that comes from various religious traditions. Okay, are really two kinds of arguments. One uh, argument which um, has to do with questions about who is really authorized to make decisions about life and death. Who has the authority to do that? Um, in you know, a secularized culture such as our own, we typically say it's the individual that has self-determination over matters that pertain to uh, their sense of ultimate meaning. But certainly within some of the religious traditions, and uh, Oregon, I need to uh, preface this, Oregon is one of the least, uh, at least according to all the statistical surveys that are put out, one of the least churched states in the United States, uh, 46th out of 50, um, less than 30% of Oregonians are affiliated with a church. And that's an important context to keep in mind for this. Washington's somewhat similar. Um, uh, anyway, within those religious traditions, the argument was this isn't, since it's about life and death, this is, isn't a matter about which human beings should be making uh, at least legal decisions for others. Okay, it's one thing for individuals within a religious tradition to make certain commitments, but this is uh, a question that really should be, uh, in terms of who has authority to make this decision, it really is a matter for God or some sacred authority. A second kind of perspective that came out of the religious, uh, religious views um, had to do with not so much who can make it, a th uh, who has authority to make this decision, but what's the value of our life? Okay, or what's the value of anyone's life? And isn't there a commitment in Western culture, certainly uh, advanced by religious traditions, but not exclusive to religious traditions, about the sanctity of human life? Um, so yes, that might have been initial part of the conversation within religious communities and religious traditions, but the notion that life is more than, human life is just more than a mere instrument to social or even personal good is, has broader resonance than just within religious traditions. Um, as part of this sort of discussion, so those were the two principal religious considerations that came into uh, the discussion. Um, those were very heavily hammered by those that supported uh, the Oregon Death with Dignity Act um, and were concerned about, as one uh, public interest or one uh, lobbying organization said, we don't want uh, Oregonians to have religion imposed on them or rammed down their throats um, in one of the more infamous commercials. So uh, that was certainly present you know, as part of this discussion, but I don't think it was really a critical uh, decisive factor one way or the other, but it needs to be noted. It was part of our public discussion and for many people still very important. There's certainly questions about, in general, leaving aside the religious considerations, about the value of personal self-determination. Okay, that's a central value in American culture, a central value in American uh, biomedical ethics. Um, and one of the issues in this particular context, again, reporting the arguments made against the Death with Dignity Act, was we have in the state of Oregon and other states as well, but in the state of Oregon in particular, there are extensive ways already in place for terminally ill Oregonians to express their wishes to engage in self-determination at the end of life. They can, uh, and this was particularly uh, significant or salient then because the year prior in 1993, <clears throat> the state legislature had indeed passed a very progressive set of laws and regulations regarding advanced directives. Um, so 
part of the issue was you haven't, we haven't given those uh, advanced directives enough sort of public education to let this whole process work out. But uh, again, people would, uh, the argument would be, well, yes, we do want to respect people's uh, self-determination and their autonomy and so forth, but uh, there's other alternatives that ought to be considered first. Um, we ought to encourage the advanced directives. We ought to encourage in a much greater way than had been previously the case, widespread access to hospice care. And uh, we ought to make our uh, provider communities, medical provider communities, much more out in the forefront in terms of pain control, pain relief, research into control of pain, and not just simply cures, but palliative uh, uh, care considerations. Um, so there's other alternatives that people could uh, uh, use legally without going to this particular resort, uh, crossing the line from what some people felt uh, was an inappropriate legal and moral line to cross. Um, so uh, uh, that, that particular way of phrasing it might be seen as a notion of uh, moral criterion of last resort, okay, that uh, morally and legally and socially we ought to be, we are obligated to try uh, certain measures as first resorts insofar as they're available to people and they should be made available to people. Um, and you move into something like uh, Death with Dignity Act or Physician Assisted Death only as a last resort. Now, just to jump ahead of the story a little bit, uh, in practice, as we've had now roughly 17 years of experience with this in the state of Oregon, it seems to be used primarily as a last resort. Um, that is, in terms of the numbers of patients that request it, the numbers of patients that receive medications, it's, uh, in practice, it's become a last resort. Um, but this had to do with sort of the moral uh, question, the legal question. Um, there were enormous concerns, and I think they still uh, continue, um, about, well, if such a law was passed, what are the consequences of such a law? If the state of Oregon was going to pass a law, or its citizens were, were going to pass a law that would say it's permissible for a physician to write a prescription to a, for a terminal Ill patient so that that patient could decide whether or not to take that medication in order to end their life in a humane and dignified manner, that's the statutory language, uh, would it really stop there? What, uh, what's to prevent this, this kind of standard slippery slope uh, argument, what would, why should Oregon stop after all in the name of self-determination? Why stop at physician-assisted death? Why not take the next step and do what we were all familiar with at that time, which was Dr. Death and Jack Kovorkian, uh, what uh, goes on in the Netherlands or more recently Belgium and Switzerland and so forth. Why, that's, to draw the line at physician-assisted death seems just as arbitrary as any other line. How is, why draw it there? Why not go the next step? So that, those were some kind of, that was a consequentialist, if you will, argument uh, that people worry about. Um, uh, slippery slope kind of argument, this law uh, initially and st still currently controversially requires the medication to be self-administered, so certain patients are precluded, particularly patients with late um, stage ALS, for example, there's been a lot of discussion about, and it also because you have to make this request six months uh, uh, after a diagnosis of a terminal illness with, uh, defined as six months or less to live means that individuals who, say, are diagnosed with uh, early stage or even late stage Alzheimer's might not be capable of making this decision during that six-month window when it's available to them. Well, uh, was it going to be possible to sort of keep that line in place, or wasn't, wasn't it going to be just by the social inertia of uh, pushing this forward to go ahead and say, okay, we're going to expand this to other constituencies such as person, so that the medication doesn't have to be self-administered or it doesn't have, the request doesn't have to be made by a person that uh, is, is competent at the time that they're diagnosed. Um, 
So those were, those were some of the consequentialist objections. There were also what I refer to as justice objections or uh, fairness objections. Particular concern, uh, this I found a little bit more persuasive uh, personally in terms of given where we were in the United States and in the state of Oregon in 1994 with access to health care, uh, which was pretty poor. I mean, there was uh, in a state of three million people, uh, um, you know, that sounds pretty small to you in greater Phoenix, but in a state of three million people and you had uh, 600,000 of those without access to health care. There was a concern that an act like this might be used uh, in a sort of cost-effective way. And there's, there were articles published to this effect in both uh, medical or professional literature as well as in some of the public editorials in the newspapers that said physician-assisted suicide, which was the term in vogue at that particular time, would be a cost-effective way to balance the health, some of the health care budget issues. Um, so uh, that particular question, is that going to be, uh, uh, is there a sense of uh, potentially having this law be exploitative of individuals who did not have the financial or social resources to basically fend, fend for themselves and lack access to health care? And then one other point that uh, sort of pertains to this in terms of a justice question, uh, uh, concern voiced by some that uh, what is presented as a right to die, at least initially, may be because of, again, uh, social issues, uh, financial indigency, indigency issues, economic issues, familial issues, may over time become not just simply a, a right to die, but a duty to die. A duty to die on behalf of one's family uh, or for the common good to uh, save, save uh, financial resources and so forth. So, those, so what I've tried to identify here are some religious objections that were articulated, uh, some objections that uh, uh, came to the forefront in terms of last resort concerns or other alternatives that might be used that were already legal, uh, questions about consequences or possible consequences, um, uh, which, uh, well, we've, we've where I stood on those. Uh, I just didn't think they were at all compelling uh, at all, those particular consequentialist uh, concerns. And then the justice, uh, equity, equality uh, considerations. Um, the last two I want to focus on because I do think that they have and continue to have some real uh, relevance and salience for me as I work with uh, on these various ethics committees at the, at the state level in the 1990s, then more recently at the local level as well as the national level, yeah, are notions of professional and institutional integrity. Um, so just to uh, say a little bit about those, uh, there's certainly a concern uh, within the state of Oregon uh, at the time that there's a particular purpose uh, to uh, the goal of, or the particular point and purpose to medicine and to professionals who take an oath to be healers, okay? And uh, whether, whether that uh, oath precludes them from, you know, prescribing a medication to a terminally ill patient to hasten their death is a question that needs at least be discussed. Um, and the way that it was put in by the uh, chair of the Oregon Medical Association was it's not that we have this strong sense of professional integrity and identity rather we need to hear from the, the state of Oregon's voters on this which suggests that the state of Oregon's voters were sort of determining the standards for medical practice on this and so where would you know in uh, the question here is what is it that medicine as a profession claims to be about does it claim to be about solely respecting the autonomous choices of terminal Ill patients and choices of others as well? Or are there certain kinds of goods intrinsic to the purpose of medicine? Uh, why, we consider, why we give it some of the social privileges that it has? That we give it professional status? And it's because it has this vocation of healing. So can those be made out to be compatible? And then the last sort of issue of integrity I, I just want to mention 
is that pertaining to the organization uh, that I've worked a lot with, hospice. Um, uh, in the state of Oregon, this was somewhat unanticipated, but in the state of Oregon, 90% of the individuals that use the act on an annual basis uh, are enrolled under hospice care. And you know, at first blush, that seems really, really surprising. Uh, because hospice, as an organization, historically, has developed out of a philosophy, uh, historically it developed out of a philosophy of being hospitable uh, to the stranger, okay? And that goes back a couple of thousand years. More recently, it was developed in the United Kingdom some 50 years ago uh, uh, by Dean, uh, Dame Cecily Saunders um, and brought to the United States roughly in the mid-1970s. And uh, uh, Cecily Saunders argued that hospice was a middle path between two alternatives that, at least on her account, and uh, she felt this would be true of most of Western culture, two alternatives that we wanted to avoid. One was uh, prolongation of a person's biological existence by technology. And the second thing that we wanted to avoid was, she put it very straightforward, euthanasia. She didn't have sort of the permutations in place in mind uh, that we would discuss it with now. But those were the two alternatives, and hospice would be the middle path to provide quality care to individuals at the end of their life without, on the one hand, tethering them to technology or, on the other hand, uh, hastening their death by requiring physicians to be direct agents of the person's death. So hospice understood itself to be uh, sort of the middle ground, the middle path. Um, and the question that's been raised for uh, at the state, the local, and the national level for hospice is, uh, given that 90% of the patients in Oregon, and this is true of Washington as well, Vermont, we don't have enough data yet to, to know, but given that most of these patients uh, that use the act are in hospice care, um, is hospice being, are hospice values being compromised? Uh, is hospice complicit in something that seems to be contrary to the philosophy and mission of hospice? And just, I, I've done a lot of research on this last, on the last five years on both the Oregon and Washington hospices. And let me just give you one small illustration of this. Um, there uh, are roughly about 65 hospices in Oregon, uh, roughly about 38 in the state of Washington. So give us an N of about 105. And I collected various kind of data from uh, 95 of those uh, 105 hospices. Um, 75% of those hospices said, uh, I mean, it's important in hospice care for hospice to never abandon a terminally ill patient. Okay, never. That's just, uh, you will, a moral prohibition that's absolute. Um, but when it came to this particular issue, uh, again, 75% of the hospices in the two states where this has been uh, in place for the longest period of time in the United States, um, said that a staff member could not be present when, an in, uh, when a person took the medication or uh, subsequently died from the medication. Um, and so that particular issue, I mean, the, so individual hospices were making that call, okay, that their staff members could not be present. And if they can't be present, isn't that a form of abandonment? Of, of a terminally ill patient, particularly in a time where there might be great vulnerability or other kinds of needs come up, where hospice is exactly the kind of organization you want uh, present. So uh, again, questions of professional and institutional integrity and organizational integrity, I think, uh, at least for me over the course of the last uh, 20 years or so, have become the ones that continue to make this debate uh, one that's important for society to have, one that uh, I think why it will be on the, our societal discussion uh, boards for a long period of time, and rightly so. We all want to experience uh, death with dignity, and we want to remain true to our own selves in that particular setting, but we would also want our family and certainly our providers to not feel morally or professionally compromised by our requests. Thank you.
Well, I think uh, Dr. Campbell laid out a lot of, of the arguments that were uh, against physician-assisted dying, and I want to turn my attention to sort of the arguments on the pro side. And I also want to um, sort of think about this question from uh, the point of view of geography. So uh, the question before the House is, should Arizonans choose to enact a law that is similar to the law that was enacted in Washington, sorry, Oregon, then Washington, Montana, and now Vermont. And I think, um, and a really important thing to think about is, well, who are the citizens of those states that have enacted this, and what are their values as a collective, and how might we learn from the values of those states and their ideas of what matters and, and where the state should or should not intervene in a very personal question, when and how to die. Um, and then how does that compare to the ethos in Arizona? And, and I can't answer that question. I'm a Seattleite, so I can only speak about, you know, I asked Jason if I needed to show you the moss under my nails. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely a Northwestern girl. But I think an important piece to be thinking about that is that the value that drives uh, the pro side probably more than any other is that of self-determination. And what does that actually mean? Um, so if you think about the sort of ethos in these four states, uh, they are all highly libertarian in orientation. Um, and they are social libertarians insofar as uh, they, they really are all about kind of put, making it incumbent upon individuals to do their best to raise themselves up and take care of themselves. So, you know, the, the frontier states, we're gonna go out and plow new territory. We're going to take care of ourselves. There's nobody looking out for us. In our history, we were as far away from the corporations and the robber barons on the East Coast as we could possibly be on purpose. And we like that. And that, that mentality is still alive and well in all of these states. Even though Vermont is on the East Coast, you have to think about it. It's a small state. It's in the very far Northeast. And they have that same kind of separatist ideology. And it's, it's seen as a social good. That is something that is highly valued. And so in those same states, they are also looking for a balance because they also recognize that for communities to be strong, we also have to be self-reliant together. So it's not a total sink or swim environment. It is a scenario in which we ask the citizens to step up and do their part. And that at a certain point, if they can't do that, we're going to step in as a collective and support them to reach their goals. So I think it's in that ethos that we're thinking about the pro arguments for why we would legalize physician-assisted dying. So there's a couple of important points here. And I think, as I learned when we were doing our study with 35 families, um, we were doing this in, we started in 1996, and it was, um, Oregon was just coming around for the second time. They just finally passed their second law. They were ready to go and implement. Um, and for us, we were all caught up in the legality piece. And so as investigators sort of under, trying to understand the lived experience of why people would make this choice and what would they be willing to go through to actually put it into practice. So in 1996, it was just legal in, in Oregon. It was not legal in Washington. And so most of the respondents in our study were doing this in an illegal environment. So they did it. Most of them completed this, which means that they were highly motivated to make this happen. So you have to ask, well, why? What did they go through and why did they do that? And in our mind, we went into this and we had on our team, we said big D and little d. And big D for us was hasten death, doing this horribly illegal thing so that you could make sure that you could hasten your death. And the little d was dying. And I have to tell you that within about the first 20 minutes of interviews with any of the families, they completely disabused us of our notions. And they flipped that and they said, no, no, you've got it all wrong. The big D is death. I'm dying. Um, and the little d is like, well, this is just a deal. This is just like my advanced directive. You know, I've already said I don't want CPR. If my heart stops, I don't want dialysis. I, I've been through the list of the things that I don't want. But what the other thing that I don't want is I don't want to die badly. And an important piece for us to think, again, historically, this is, do, you, do any of you remember Jack Kevorkian besides his movie? Like with, yeah, OK. So for those of you who weren't around at the time, this was a really bizarre situation where you have a, a man who is a physician by training but is a pathologist and hasn't seen patients in practice in any kind of a relational way for most of his professional life. 
but he is sort of the extreme extreme of self-determination and has decided that he's got the um, phantaton, which is basically this, this IV hookup where the person pulls a clamp and then a series of IVs start to drip lethal things into these people and they died. But they were dying in a rusty VW van in a parking lot behind a hotel in Michigan. Now, I don't know about you, but that does not sound like dignity to me. <laughs> that just does not sound like the way that I would like to go. Um, so the, the thing at stake in this regard then was, what is it that people are working against that they would go to such great lengths? People were traveling from states all over the country to be in Dr. Kevorkian's van. So what were they fighting against that they would be willing to go to such extreme lengths? And essentially, the way I used to come, to, that I've come to understand this is that for the last 50 years, we have been putting so much energy into extending life that we sort of lost track of when life actually ends. So we've extended it far beyond nature's borders. And in many, many cases, that's a terrific thing. And that has become the purpose of medicine. But there are mortal limits to all of those things. And some of them have sort of flipped to where we now may consider some of those things to be battery. So we are actually beating people up in the name of sanctity of life. So we can't let them go under any circumstances. And we prolong and we prolong and we prolong. And we have no capacity to ever allow those individuals to reach the goals of their lives that they may like. So they are alive in an ICU on a whole series of ventilators and pressors and all kinds of interventions. But they're not at home. They're not pursuing the things that make life meaningful to them. They're not actually living the life that has meaning for them. So advanced directives got put into place as the first uh, response to that technological progress so that people could begin to put limits on things and say, I don't really want that. Thank you, but I don't really want that. Because the default, I mean, if any of you get sick, you're going to maybe be in a crisis situation and find yourself in a hospital. And the, nobody asks you, what are you here for? <laughs> because the assumption is that you went to the hospital because you're not well. And the goal is you're going to get out of the hospital being better than you came in. And for most people who go to the hospital, that is certainly the case. But for the people that we're talking about, people with terminal illnesses, people with really advanced stages where we may not have a particular time frame, but we know we certainly wouldn't be surprised if they died in the next year or two, that's the group of people that we're kind of talking about here. We're not talking about any of you who are alive and well and attending classes and getting your lives together and moving on. We're talking about people who are in the sunset phase of their life. And for those people, having grown up through this particular moment in time, the thing that you have, it's a little bit like a, like a movie that you run. So how many of you have had someone close to you die? OK, I don't know what your life experiences are, but the people that we met in my study, I want to say that the, the movie that they were running in their heads was a really bad movie. When you start to talk to them about why they're pursuing this, it's because of all the things that happened to the people that they loved that they live as sort of a daily trauma. It, it was just a bad death in every possible way. They didn't get what they wanted. They didn't get pain relief. They didn't get to stay at home. They didn't have to be surrounded by their loved ones. They didn't get to do a lot of the things that they wanted. And what they got instead was to be in a place they didn't want to be, getting a lot of interventions that they didn't want, that for the United States may have bankrupted their families. Um, so there's a lot of things that go along with that intensive, life-extending, life-prolonging care at the end of life. And this move towards physician-assisted dying, I see as another step in that continuum of people trying to take that back and be truly self-determining in terms of being able to say what choices they actually have at the end of their life. So I think that's a really important piece to understand. And the things that they're also pushing back against was that until this happened, and I think this is sort of an interesting silver lining to the Oregon statute, is that um, Oregon was, is, Dr. Campbell said it's a small state. It's, uh, the geography is very spread out, so it's very rural. And so that means there's not a lot of concentrated places of, of 
um, expertise in medicine. And across the board in the United States, one of the least specialized and most important uh, areas of medicine is in specialty pain control. And um, actually, Oregon had a pretty dismal track record with this. And what happened as a result of passing the law was that that changed overnight. And Oregon became one of the most responsive um, pain areas in the country. Their pain scores in terms of how often did they assess pain amongst their patients and how often did they actually do something about that pain to change that score and bring it down, skyrocketed. And you can imagine, nobody wanted to be the doctor that said, oh, my patient had to kill themselves because I was really bad at pain management. I was an incompetent clinician and I allowed their suffering to continue unabated to the point where their only option was they needed to kill themselves with an overdose of barbiturates. Nobody wanted to have that card that they passed out to anybody. So it was an interesting kind of motivator. And in the context of all of these critiques, it's true that this law and these laws are a bit like the tail wagging the dog. You know? But it's almost as if you know, reasonable conversation, sort of trying to deal with the extremes that are everywhere else in the system. Like we get very freaked out about this law, but we don't necessarily get freaked out about routine use of these incredibly expensive treatments that happen in hospitals every day, often against people's wishes, in part because nobody asked them what they wanted. So we have this sort of very elaborate system about expressing choice, and it is gotten our attention about starting to ask some of the questions that you might want to ask before you have to get to such an extreme. Does that make sense, folks? Kind of make some sense? So um, I think there's two other pieces of information that I want to lay out for you just that, that are important, and that is, why a law? Like, why do we need to write a law about this? Isn't if we're going to have a doctor-patient relationship where we negotiate all kinds of one-on-one -on -one decisions and make treatment choices, and this is essentially the argument in Montana, they don't have a regulatory system in Montana. They have essentially said it's not illegal. I love double negatives. Um, it's not illegal because this, this decision is in the same realm as the other personal decisions that get made in the context of a physician-patient relationship. So much the same way that you would say you have disease X, I recommend all these treatments, they are going to accomplish these goals, and that's what's going to let you live the life that you want. And that's, in theory, how medicine should be practiced. Start with what the patient's goals are, and then tailor your treatment to those goals. And if those goals are unattainable, then you give them other options to sort of support them to get to where they can be. And this is, as Dr. Campbell said, a last resort, but not one that requires a great deal of, of, of regulation or oversight. So why do we have different laws in Oregon, Washington, and Vermont. And I would argue that it is because all laws are a, com a compromise on a social continuum. So as Dr. Campbell said, we have on the one extreme the notion that we have no agency to make those decisions about when we die. It's, this is in God's hands. It's not a mortal decision for us to make. On the other hand, we have the uber self-determinists who think that it's only our decision to make. And both of those represent sort of extreme positions. And laws are all about compromise. So what we've done is we've said, OK, well, yes, we see that there are people who believe in the sanctity of life. But this is a voluntary effort. So you don't have to do this. There's nobody saying that you must die this way. It's just on the table as a, one of many options. On the other hand, we're also not going to say anybody who just doesn't feel like it anymore is going to be able to die tomorrow. Right, so bad date, things went south, kind of blue, failed an exam, that's it, I've had it, I want to go get a script and be done with my life. And we're saying, no, that's not okay either. So when you look at the specifics on here about the eligibility criteria, you have to think that this was a very thoughtful conversation about what would be the bar that we're going to put to make this a little bit hard for people, actually quite a bit hard for people to do this. It's one of the reasons why it's rare, um, because you have to fulfill all these requirements. You have to be terminal, which means you have to have a prognosis of six months or less. We're really bad at that. We don't really know how to do prognosis very well. Um, some diseases you can't do that for, 
Like if you have heart disease, you may or may not be able to say that someone's gonna be here in six months time. We can tell you like the week before, but that's too late. You can't get started a week before, this takes time. We have a stipulation that this be done in the context of, a, of two different kinds of relationships with physicians. So there is um, the notion that your attending physician or your regular physician, your primary care physician, is one of the people who will be doing an evaluation of your request. Why are you doing this? What's motivating you? What, what problem are you trying to solve by asking for these pills? And the idea behind that is that this is a person who, in theory, um, has traveled with you on your disease trajectory. So they've seen you be ill. They've watched you and your family grapple with exacerbations of your illness. They've seen you when you feel really bad. And they've seen the kinds of decisions that you have made to stay in this game and keep being, moving forward. So they have that history with you and they have, in an ideal sense, some sense of who you are as a person and what your value system is so they can evaluate whether this is sort of a new thing that came out of the blue or if this is just sort of a, another example of who you are. This seems to be pretty consistent. And we care about that for cognitive capacity reasons. We don't want people to suddenly become depressed and the world turns very dark because this is a path of no return. So we have to be careful about that. Similarly, we ask for a consulting physician, somebody who does not have that relationship, because at the same time, sometimes that longitudinal relationship can get a little too chummy. So you go see them, you like them as people, they like you as people, and they may lose some of that critical distance that helps us to establish, wait a minute, I need to ask you some hard questions and I'm not gonna make any assumptions about who you are. I need you to answer them from my naive perspective so that I can test to see whether your story makes sense to me, whether those reasons are coherent. Uh, maybe between you and your primary care doc, you've explored some things, but it may be kind of explicit. Like, what did you actually talk about with respect to palliative options? Did you get referred for pain care? Did you get uh, a second opinion on your diagnosis? Did you have some of these things that you may seem sort of bureaucratic and procedural but are really intended to make sure that this evaluation process is rigorous and thorough and not trivial. And it's also a point where if the person has not had a chance to come forward and sort of speak their narrative, who am I now that I'm dying? And what is important to me in this last phase of my life? You know, is this a desperate attempt? So one, an interesting statistic that is a really hard one to travel with is how many people, we can see from the um, reports on all the websites, how many people ask for prescriptions and then how many people actually fill them. And there's always a gap. It's, it's somewhere around two thirds. What we don't know is how many people asked because they don't have to write that down anywhere. So if I just go in and I'm like, I'm interested in the physician, the Death with Dignity Act. And we learned in our study that, that it was a little bit like a litmus test. So it would be one way for a doctor and a patient, a patient to go into a doctor's office and sort of find out what kind of doctor they were. So if we went in and we said, I want physician-assisted suicide, and you were like, okay, let's talk about that. That would be one reaction. If you said, I want to talk about physician-assisted suicide, like, no, I'm not going to talk about that. Then that's a different kind of relationship. And it was, it was a way for patients to sort of find out what kind of doctor is this. What kind of communication am I going to be able to have with this person? And so that piece then, where was I going with this? Um, I don't know, I lost my train, sorry. Um, but the, the idea behind all of this, I think, is, is that you are establishing the authenticity of the person and that it's in the context of a relationship that you get to understand who that person is. So I think I'll end with that. So thanks very much, guys. That was, uh, that was really great. Um, so I kind of want to, I mean, I really like this, uh, Dr. Starks, on the, uh, this uh, call to us in Arizona to kind of determine what our ethos is. And I, I guess I want to explore a little bit in terms of uh, like individual decision making. Uh, 
with respect to you know this this kind of choice, whether you know in terms of a vote or how I believe what I believe in this uh, idea of physician aided dying, um, and in line with that, I guess I'm I'm a little intrigued with the whole notion of dignity, right? And what kinds of things do we want to ask ourselves about? Um, what do I think of as a dignified death? Uh, what does that mean? How does that vary from person to person, culture to culture? Um, I, you know, just for example, I, so I have like a background in, you know, in Catholicism and so forth, and there's a, a guy named Pedro Arupe who was the head of the Jesuit order, and he was uh, in the process of dying, and, uh, you know, people were all concerned about him and everything, and, and he just said to him, you know, this is what I've been praying for all my life, you know, to be able to relinquish who I am. I mean, it was just a beautiful way of approaching death, right? And to me, I mean, I, that represents to me like the ultimate in dignity, right? The dignified death, but it's this this way of kind of being at peace with relinquishing oneself, you know, and uh, so I just, I guess I want to ask a little bit about uh, your experiences of, of variances with between cultures or people with this, with the result of, as a result of thinking about dignity. What does dignity mean? What does a dignified death mean? Uh, and I think, Dr. Campbell, you've written some stuff on this with regard to its relation to autonomy, so. Okay, I guess uh, go with me. So, one of the, one of the, to me, real philosophical and ethical vacuums in the uh, discussion in, in Oregon, and to some extent elsewhere, I'd also claim, um, but certainly in Oregon, was even though this statute that the voters were, for this referendum, the voters were uh, casting their ballots on was entitled the Death with Dignity Act, there had not been any discussion about the concept of dignity and what exactly it meant and what a dignified death would be comprised by, other than the implication was a person could make a choice uh, based on their, their values of self, uh, self determine based on patient self-determination. That's what dignity seemed to come down to with self-determination. You know, at one level, I can certainly accept that. On another level, I think that's a very thin, truncated uh, view of notions of dignity. Um, so uh, I wanted to try and push that a little bit further and see if we could get a more robust understanding of not only dignity, but particularly death with dignity. So there's certain kinds of things that I, uh, as, as uh, we just heard, there's certain kinds of what was your phrasing, your metaphor of the film running in, the, in your mind? Okay, the film, the bad movie, okay? And we've got a good sense of what a bad death is, I think. Um, it's a death like, say, someone like Terry Schiavo has experienced. No one really wants to go through that kind of process. I don't, I don't think. You can, I might be wrong, but... Um, okay, I'm, I've just been corrected. Some people, some people want to go through that. Yeah. But I, th I think uh, there are certain characteristics uh, that I'm not going to claim universality, but uh, in terms of a dignified death that are beyond uh, auton autonomy and self-determination, they would include having an opportunity to come to relational closure with uh, the most significant persons in one's life, loved ones, uh, partners, and, 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 and so forth, children, uh, parents, and, and the like. Uh, the term phrase authenticity was, uh, has, has come up. I think that's a really crucial aspect of dying with dignity, that you, want, you should be allowed to die in a manner that's consistent with the values by which you've lived over the course of your life, that there shouldn't be this radical disconnect or dissonance between how you die and how you've lived, that authenticity is really a central part of, uh, of, of the notion of, of death with dignity and there are people that can assess that besides yourself. Uh, physicians, if they've been in a long-term relationship, uh, can, can help in that regard. Hospice, uh, sometimes uh, 
the state laws uh, require a fairly minimal duration of relationship between the physician and the patient. In Oregon, the median is 30 days uh, from the request to the, uh, to the death. So it's a little bit difficult there, but I think notions of authenticity can be assessed, and, and I think they're very critical. Um, other aspects of dignity, I mean, those are what I would call freedom for. Dignity gives us a sense of freedom for authenticity, a freedom for relational closure, a freedom, uh, freedom for being able to select the kind of death according to our own values. And it's a freedom against or freedom from having death, a kind of death imposed upon us by some kind of social norm, some kind of religious community, or some kind of professional association. Okay, uh, dignity also is comprised of freedom from life-extending technologies that are not effective in terms of medical benefit to the patient. It might be symbolically beneficial to the family, but to the patient. Uh, dignity is comprised in freedom from that uh, technological tethering. That was the, one of the goals of hospice. Um, and also, dignity is comprised, at least in part, of freedom from pain and suffering. Uh, now, neither the Oregon nor the Washington nor the Vermont law says anything really about these decisions being rooted in freedom from pain and suffering, partly because those are phenomena that are a little bit hard to quantify and measure, even though I've got the expert on metrics right beside me. It's a little bit hard to sort of uh, measure suffering. What you can measure, self or at least what you can get a pretty clear idea on, is, is on self-determination. But I do think that part of what constitutes a dignified death is to the extent possible, and this is where hospice is very good, this is where, as was indicated, the state of Oregon really, or the Oregon medical profession really ramped up their game following the passage of this act, is uh, palliative care, keeping people reasonably comfortable in the context of the dying process. So those would be some aspects, not the full story certainly, but uh, I don't know, it's probably too much longer than you anticipated, but anyway, some aspects that I think if we're talking about a death with dignity, which I think is something we would all want, uh, some features or characteristics of what dignity might constant, be comprised of. I completely, I, I think it's important to also remember that uh, along with compromise also comes politicking. So it was a very deliberate set of words that were chosen to associate with this. And I think it's, um, it, it's you know, it's an, we could spend at least two hours talking about those three words. But uh, what I'll just say very briefly is uh, I've always found it ironic that the only way in which we can publicly discuss dignified deaths is through an, uh, an overdose of barbiturates. Um, my whole reason for being on the planet is to advance palliative care, which is the care that if I were queen, 100% of us would get. And some number of those 100%, if it's right now, it's less than 001%. It's a very, very small number of the overall people who are going to go to this extreme to define digni a dignified death. So uh, it is definitely politicking to sort of elevate the notion uh, that dignity is tied to choice, but it is by f there's a lot of things we could be doing and should be doing to ensure dignified deaths for all people, not just a very s tiny, tiny minority who are positioned to, s to s pursue this law. That actually leads into to my question. So I'm interested in what, what becomes convoluted or what gets lost in these conversations. So, um, so Dr. Campbell mentioned that one of the arguments against is that there are other alternatives and that we, um, and then we lose the conversation about equity and e equality. And also we, we, um, we may, might not think about, think as hard as we want to about integrity in the systems and where we lose it. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Starks talks about talked about an excessive focus on prolonging life and in, in her writings has written um, beautifully about the kinds of conversations that we might need to have around death. But I'm wondering what features of either our current medical system in, or the systems in Oregon and Washington before the laws, what features of healthcare insurance or Medicaid or Medicare um, or just our, our kind of cultural ideology about death that either impede or promote 
a good death, right? The kind of death that we would want. Um, I'm sure we all have lots to say about that. Uh, so, um, I had the privilege of, of being uh, in attendance at a talk by Diane Meyer, who is the director of the Center to Advance Palliative Care out of New York. And she's a brilliant geriatrician who has really changed the face of what care could look like. And I think the short answer, her analysis was the ratio of social care to medical care that we provide to people at the end of life. So if you think about it, you can, uh, if you have insurance, and now hopefully with the uh, Obamacare, you do have insurance. So if you needed um, an aide to come in and help you um, get dressed in the morning, um, get your breakfast going, get up and, and going, you can't get that paid for. But if you need an MRI or you need a bypass or surgery or you need chemotherapy or you need fourth tier chemotherapy, that's probably not going to make a difference in your life at all except to make you pretty sick, that you can get. So she actually uh, used the story of um, Dame Cicely Saunders, who, um, who when she died of cancer, um, she was still living in uh, a classic UK bed sit, which is a three-story townhouse, lots of stairs. We're talking somebody in end-stage cancer. You're pretty weak. Walking is hard when you have end-stage cancer. But um, the UK has what they call a tuck-in service. So um, that meant that somebody came, usually a high school student, and most of their tuck-in service vo are volunteers, and they take advantage, and you could imagine this here, where we have a cadre of service learners who are trying to do good in society, and we have no place to send them. So there's this gigantic need that we could fill, and in Cicely Saunders' case, who was the mother of hospice, did not go on hospice until she was almost dead. Her, her length of stay was just like everybody else's, not very long. Um, and, the, and part of the reason why was the same reason why we don't pursue hospice longer than we do, although it is one of the few avenues where you could actually get some of the social care. That's how we have included that as one of the benefits of hospice, is you can get an aide to come and help you get dressed and bathe and do all those things that you otherwise couldn't get. But in um, Dame Saunders' case, she had a, a, a teenager, and she had a cadre of people, so they were people she could develop a relationship over time. They came in in the morning, they got her up, they got her up the two flights of stairs because the loo was on the top floor. Um, they got her dressed, they brought her down those sets of stairs and got her set up in her bedsit on the ground floor, and she had the opportunity to have people come and visit her, which she was very famous, lots of people came to visit, but she couldn't have the visitors see her in her jammies. So at the end of the day, another round of people would come and get her ready for bed and tuck her in. And, and that, I think, would make a huge difference in dignity and capacity and, ca and cost. Um, thanks. Uh, and it's a really wonderful question. I mean, uh, what's lost in this effort to promote a death with dignity at? Uh, what's getting put on the back burner, so to speak? One of the concerns I had, and frankly I still have uh, with such, such an emphasis or the Oregon law, but at least back in 1994, 97, was uh, I was very concerned about the equity in healthcare issue. And I felt that uh, if we were going to look at some of the European models, uh, which people were and people do, and say, I mean, Margaret Batten at the University of Utah, very, uh, good colleague, um, but uh, she says we have to go or think about going in the direction of the Netherlands. Well, the context there, and the issue of context ethos was raised in the first uh, comment. Um, the context there is they have access, universal access to, to basic health care, and we don't, uh, or at least, well, still, even at least according to last statistics, some 20 million Americans don't have access to basic health care, even with the Affordable Care Act. So I've felt strongly and argued at the time that we needed to take on that issue and really work through it. Um, and then some of the issues that would come out of that would include the kind of equitable access to palliative care and other kinds of care that are needed by dying persons or persons that are terminally ill. In that sense, I think we got the sort of sequence wrong and hopefully now we'll be able to correct it somewhat. Um, uh, the other thing I appreciate the sort of story about uh, uh, Dame Cicely Saunders is when you focus in some of these discussions on law and on policy, as much as that is important, 
you tend to lose, or what drops out is the actual experience of patients, which is why I find your research so helpful. Um, the motivation for the Oregon law was uh, of, of a nurse that was caring for a state legislature who had contracted ALS and was in the last throes of, of it. Um, of, and that, that story was what really galvanized individuals in the state to put, for, or at least the Oregon Death with Dignity proponents, to put forward the law. So individual stories can be, I mean, again, there's a level which we need to talk about this as a policy issue, but the level of individual experience, individual stories, um, and the stories of relationships between physicians and patients are something I think gets lost a lot. And I have to say, uh, some of the regulatory oversight that occurs in Oregon and, and Washington, what's available to the public is a set of statistics, and not, which some of those are not terribly reliable, and uh, not stories. And I think if we had some more stories and narratives of personal experiences uh, with, you know, it doesn't have to be this was the greatest thing or uh, I went this particular path like 99% of the other dying persons in Oregon and it worked out uh, well for uh, our family. But if you had more personal stories, I think you would have a more kind of compelling and rich and informed uh, public uh, discussion about the ethics. Well, I do have a story, actually. <laughs> Maybe it'll open up others as, as well. Uh, so when I was in, in Galveston, I had, uh, I was teaching a, a course in uh, the metaphysics of medicine, and uh, as a part of that course, uh, I had students, um, we arranged for students to talk to people who were approaching death and there, we went and saw this one guy who was uh, a homeless guy and he was in the hospital and he was, uh, at the time, he was living in the shed, the lawn shed of a, a house and uh, he wanted to, he was in a stage where he wanted to go into hospice, but the only thing he could do, they, they wouldn't set up the hospice situation in the lawn shed because he didn't have running water and a number of other things, no air conditioning in Galveston and all that kind of thing. So he, he they asked him, they, they said, you know, you have to move into a group home, which was going to be off the island. He didn't have a way to drive. He had just a few friends and he was going to have to give them up. So it was this quality of life, you know, he was going to get the hospice care, but he was going to be disconnected from any kind of social, uh, you know, connection and so forth. And, you know, it was just, I mean, it just really, really hit me because he could not talk, right? And so we were, we visited with him for a couple hours and he was just uh, uh, not able to speak. We had to kind of read his lips or whatever. And, and, you know, so we, we, they asked him, is this what you want? And he said, what choice do I have, you know? And, it, you know, I felt really bad about having my student using him in a way to, you know, as a spectacle for my students. But, you know, I really appreciated, too, that they were exposed to the kinds of situations that somebody like that is involved with. And, you know, you talk about the whole issues of justice and what's available. What is it like to be able to, to try to care for somebody when this is all you can offer? And it's, you know, it's, it's a limited thing. So, I don't know, I just I wanted to tell that story, but I don't know if you have other stories about your frustration along that line, that'd be great. I was going to turn it to the audience, actually. I was going to, we could tell stories all night long, but I'd rather tell the story that answers one of your questions. So I'm wondering if we have any comments or questions from the audience. And there is a microphone in the aisles, if you can make your way toward them, just so we can record them.
Uh, first, I would like to ask Dr. Campbell a little clarification on the timing. get a choice until you have at least a six month uh, prognosis uh, prognosis prognosis of six months or less do you have uh, do you have to wait another 30 days or how that all works uh, so the the question was in terms of what's the time waiting period within the within which one can request uh, leaf, uh, medication to end one's life. Uh, and uh, so you have to be diagnosed with a terminal illness with an expectation that you will have less than six months or less to live. I mean, that's, you know, pretty regularized around the United States in terms of uh, financial reimbursements and so forth for hospice care, for example. So it has to be within that six months time frame, and you need to be, you have, need to make the request within that six months time window, okay? So that's why you need to be competent and make, have decision-making capacity within that. Once you've made that, say if I was uh, diagnosed um, tonight and I had till, okay, till April 1st, okay, this is my six-month window. Well, I can make the request tomorrow on October 1st and presuming that I've met all the other criteria, I can receive the medication on October 15th. Okay, so within a 50, once you've sort of met the qualifications of the six month period, then you've got sort of a 15 day period. And as was discussed before, part of that is to ensure that this is a choice that is consistent over a period of time, that it is authentic to your wishes. It's just not a, you're responding uh, in a way that we, often with, with bad news and so forth. So that's, does that answer your question about the, yeah? Um, Buying, that is the uh, amount of, it costs a family uh, to keep a person hospital situation or uh, at home or a nursing situation and whether it would be better to hasten uh, the process of death in order to, to put it bluntly, save money for a family which is maybe financially stressed. Yeah, uh, really, really excellent question, very uh, common question that, that occurred. Um, and of course, that, that's relevant not only to a Death with Dignity Act, it's relevant relevant to what we are willing to expand today in terms of our uh, Medicaid budget for ineffective medical treatment over the last six months of life, which is uh, roughly around $70 billion or so. Um, it's enormous, and we have a difficulty letting go of, of our loved ones for various kinds of reasons. But that's the amount of money that we're spending that has no medical benefit. So in that context, the question that you asked is, yes, I mean, it was raised uh, at several different uh, junctures. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there were a couple of arguments that uh, were made pretty, pretty uh, vocally that physician-assisted suicide in the context of where we were in 1994 with 20% of Oregonians not having access to health care would actually be a uh, savings mechanism, cost savings mechanism. It would be cost effective for the healthcare system to do that so that it could reallocate some re resources elsewhere. And others would kind of flip that and say, well, if you really want to, if this is not about patient self determination, but really about saving money, then let's keep going, okay? Don't worry about the medication because then the individual may, not, may or may not take it and they may or may not uh, die within a certain amount of period. Uh, let's provide the lethal injections, okay? Because that will, then you have death occur immediately. Um, and so, you, again, so it, it was presented on, on both sides. Um, and it's, you know, in terms of what's been lost out of this debate, to go back to that excellent question, I think losing sight of how much money we're expending currently on ineffective medical care uh, sometimes can get lost. But... Um, my name's Paul Stander. I'm, I'm a physician. I'm an internist, geriatrician, hospice and palliative care physician, so I 
kind of live this, quote unquote, every day. Uh, so I commend you all for bringing this subject to the fore. Um, I do think to some degree you've framed it slightly incorrectly in terms of death with dignity, because I do think it's better to frame it as a good death versus a bad death. And at least within the hospice world, we consider a good death, many of the things you've said, you know, pain and symptom free to the greatest extent possible, driven by what that individual wants at home or in a home-like setting to the greatest degree possible with free access to their loved ones present. And most of us within the hospice palliative care world do not believe that it's really that necessary to have this kind of assisted death for me, because we don't really think it accomplishes necessarily the good death. We think we can do it pretty well within the hospice and palliative care world. I love Di Diane Meyer. She's one of my heroes. She's the icon. And I think that the access to palliative care and hospice, I mean, I'm involved here locally with Banner and at the VA and other places, the number of palliative care programs that are expanding to me is a better solution than prescribing and if you even prescribing medications for patients to take because number one if you look at these numbers it's relatively small numbers all the provisions that you have to put in to get it passed politically heck half these people are going to die before they meet those provisions we're not good at you know even the lethal injections we've seen how dismal those have been in some states and frankly you know, it's not, we can't guarantee that I give you a certain amount of medicine, you're not gonna, you know, aspirate and, you know, have a really undignified death. So I, I think this is the, the wrong answer for the goals that you all have rightly, and we all share. I, I also wanna say that the current healthcare system, the fee-for-service system has, tremendous perverse incentives for doing what you have said to, from a financial standpoint, whether it's physicians or hospitals or others, have benefited from a lot of this excessive care. I think that framework is also changing, and we are looking at a value-based reimbursement model, only pay for what really is worthwhile and not give them that fourth cycle of chemotherapy. But I have to say the anecdote that I would like to point out is that more often than not, what I see, it's not the physicians in the intensive care. I'm gonna set aside the oncologists because they are somewhat of a different breed. But a lot of the doctors in the intensive care don't wanna be keeping some of these people on ventilators or giving them. It's driven by the patients or more often family who are incredibly unreasonable in their demands or desires whether it's out of guilt or keep mom alive or whatever. And, and we're really, you know, in, in put in very difficult positions. So I just wanted to throw, you know, so, so again, getting, and there's, I'm sure you're familiar with the conversation project and other efforts, you know, to educate people. I mean, CPR is not what you see on, um, what's, that, what's that show up in Seattle? I forget. Yeah, Grey's Anatomy, where they, you know, they shock people and they miraculously wake up and everybody walks away and go their merry way, you know, and that's what people sometimes think. I mean, you know, so anyway, I've, I've said a lot. I haven't asked any questions, but I, I'm just giving you a little bit of feedback of some of us on the front lines. And I know you guys are big supporters of hospice and palliative care. And so I appreciate that as well. Yeah, I, I think I really appreciate that comment. And, I, and just in response to the families, I think we need to be a little bit careful with that um, in two particular ways. One is we always get, we, the, the medical community, I'm speaking as somebody who's part of the medical center, we get really angry when the families don't agree with us when it's time to stop. Um, but I think the piece that we need to keep in mind at all times is we get angry when people are sitting around waiting for the miracle, but we kind of forget that we made the miracle happen a whole bunch of times until just now. So if this happens to be your fourth ICU stay, the fact that you got to go home after the last three when everybody thought that was not a miracle is part of what sets this expectation. So it, it's, there is no one force in this that gets us to where we are, 
but you're absolutely right. I think there, there, there are a lot of assumptions and um, incentives that have that were never really planned. They were all, for the most part, fairly reactionary, and they weren't about dying. And so what we have is a is a is a good system of care for people who are going to live, but we have a really lousy system of care for people who are going to die. And, and we need to really think about that. Anytime there's a referendum, there seems to be interest groups that are involved in uh, campaigning, advertising, to inform the public and also to put forth their own views. Uh, in the Washington and Oregon situations, uh, what role do doctors play in that? And from a bioethics perspective, uh, what role ought they to play in such a conversation? Well, it's very interesting in the Oregon context. Uh, you really, two of the, if not the major, two of the major players in the uh, campaign leading up to the vote were two physicians group. One was called Physicians for Death with Dignity, and they were primarily uh, uh, associated with major ho state hos or major hospital teaching hospital in the state, Oregon Health and Science University. Um, uh, and then you had a different physicians group called Physicians for Compassionate Care. Um, and you know, interestingly enough, you got a polarization within the medical community, and you got a polarization of terms with compassion and care set on one side and dignity set on another. And that, that's why I, I wanted to stress in my remarks that uh, there's an issue of professional and physician integrity that I think needs to be raised here. If we consider anybody that's a professional, that route goes, the linguistic route goes back to you're going to profess something. And we as a society have you know, a claim on physicians, as we do on educators, to know what it is you're going to profess. Um, and it's not that dignity and compassion and care are mutually exclusive. There's something that, there's a discussion that needs to happen between those conflicting parties within medicine to at least sort those out, um, rather than sort of suggesting to the public, well, you're either for dignity or you're for compassion. I mean, that's, that doesn't make any conceptual sense, but that's how it was kind of portrayed and educated to the extent that it was in, in the state of Oregon. From the standpoint of um, uh, bioethics, uh, what ought physicians to be, uh, to be doing, I think that, I mean, my, my own sense is that physicians ought to be engaged, as with anyone, as citizens in public discourse. Um, I, I think I feel more comfortable if uh, physician associations, uh, and some did this and some didn't in Oregon, would sort of say, as a professional association, uh, we're going to remain neutral on this question, thus giving the fullest latitude for our individual members to uh, do this or go this way. I, I'm not going to hold that on every situation. If they said physicians ought to do something really reprehensible, we're going to be neutral about that. That's not what I mean. But on this one, I'd say, you know, uh, allow the civic discourse to happen. Understand that part of what needs to happen is a recognition that the medical profession stands for something, and it stands for something morally. It's got a moral core to it, uh, and it's got a professional core to it, um, and have representatives voice that. And as this issue indicated, there's disagreements about that. Have those sort of uh, talked about. But thank you for your question. Thank you for this program. It's exceptional. Um, I am a lawyer, and I'm also a person who spent four years before that working for a very fine hospice organization here in the Valley. And everything that you're touching on um, is so significant and so meaningful in this dialogue. Death's a very individual experience for people. I think the notion of dignity is about what it means to the individual. Having said that, one of the things that I'm troubled by in this law is the, in any of the laws, well, I, I like Montana's version, which is simply 
case law, which says you have a right and there aren't these other very, very difficult hurdles that you have to meet to make use of this law. My personal perspective, and I've seen it over and over again, is some of the people who need this assistance the most from their physician are people who cannot make use of this law. They are, it's too late. They're unable to physically take the prescriptions, etc. Or if they are unfortunately afflicted with a dementia, they are simply, they're able to make a decision before they're within their six months of dying, but not after and be deemed competent by our courts. Having said all that, um, I would love your opinion on whether or not you think there is a place for extending this type of decision to those people who cannot. For instance, ALS. One of you told a story about a person with ALS. How do we extend this right that's very, very important to someone who cannot use that law but is equally entitled to the death that he or she would like? Because let's, one of the things that's most critical about this law, and one of the reasons that any of these laws are passed, it's about liability, and it's about protecting the physicians. It's not necessarily about setting up this opportunity for the individual. What's critical in a lot of these is the physicians can't be prosecuted, which is what they need to assist. You make a lot of really important and good points. I, I wouldn't say it's only about physician liability, but the fact that if, if physicians follow all the steps, they are um, protected from any liability prosecution is a really important piece because it creates a safe haven for them to even have these conversations. I now remember the point I was trying to make when I lost my train of thought, which was, I was talking about the difference between how many people ask for um, this assistance be, be, and don't even take it to the next step of making a formal request. And estimates are something like 10 to 1. And, and so it's really, oftentimes we found it's, it's sort of couched language for being able to talk about dying, because we can't even talk about dying. It's a pretty hard thing to do. But I'm going to, uh, I'm going to uh, refer to a psychiatric advance directive as a potential parallel to think about uh, in terms of extending this to people who lose uh, decisional capacities and are not able, to, because the, one of the requirements for this law is that you be of, you have physical and mental capacity to ingest pills. And by mental capacity, it means that you are in a state of mind that allows for consent, which means that you are able to understand what the consequences of and the, the risks and benefits and alternatives to this treatment would be. And in that case, you need to be able to say, yes, if I take these pills, I will die and I won't be able to rescind that once we get started here. And that is the greatest concern, is that if we don't have people who can say that before they ingest the pills, then we are creating a huge problem of um, protecting extremely vulnerable people. So this is one of those, when I was talking about the trade-offs, we are erring in favor of protecting vulnerable people, even people who, at a prior moment, we're adamant and are pretty sure that they're not going to change their minds. And the first case with Jack Kevorkian is the perfect example. Janet Adkins had uh, what most people would consider early Alzheimer's disease. She was playing tennis the day before she died with her son. So she was pretty actually healthy, but she had experienced her dementia enough to know what was coming. And this is one of the paradoxes of the law. If you can't allow for somebody else to administer the medications when you are no longer of mind or body to do it on your own, then if you're going to exercise this at all, you are actually inviting a very premature death. So you are cutting off whatever that future potential time may be in order to stay within the capacity window. And so it, it is a paradox. And the way that we have uh, dealt with this in another domain where issues of mental capacity are at stake and being able to state preferences for a future 
are psychiatric advanced directives. So you, for those of you not familiar with those, imagine that you have uh, schizophrenia or that you have a bipolar disorder where when your mental illness is uncontrolled and you are in an active phase, you are not acting rationally. And so this is a little bit like the Ulysses contracts, which are when you are forecasting about a future and you say, don't listen to me then, listen to me now, and take my word today, and whatever you do, I will tell you something really different in the future, and you are to ignore what I say then and act now, act on what I'm telling you now. And so with, with respect to psychiatric advanced directives, for example, where it's things where people are negotiating what kind of medications are they going to take if, or, be, or, or be willing to have administered to them when they're in a psychotic state. And sometimes they'll say, yes, you can do that. And sometimes they'll say, I don't care how crazy I am. I do not want any medications. And that's what they're supposed to be able to execute with a psychiatric advanced directive. So they're, as with all of these directives, they're absolutely outstanding in principle. And they are a nightmare in practice. So my bet is that until we fix some of the many structural problems that Jenny was talking about and Mark was talking about and Courtney as well in terms of access, in terms of um, real choices that people have about dignity, in terms of timing, in terms of all those different things, I think we, we keep trying to fix the problem from the wrong end is my opinion. So in essence, you're saying there is this very vulnerable group of people who are vulnerable either way. They're vulnerable if they can't get what they want, and, they're vulnerable, and, and, and for the few who might get what they want, they make everybody else very vulnerable. And one of the cons that you didn't mention was a critique from the disability community, which is very strong and very important, and we have to take their critiques very, very seriously, and I do. And that is to say, when those able-bodied people project poor quality of life onto the quality of life that I have as a disabled person, then you are robbing me of my dignity, and you are telling me that my life is not worth living. Now, I think the individuals are not actually saying that, but at a social conversation level, that is the message that we are conveying. And I think it is in that spirit that will prevent us from extending these rights to those individuals. And I agree with the physician who said, and we have to kind of ask ourselves the question, if all the rights we could extend to vulnerable people, are these really the ones that we want to spend this much political energy on? It's a really tiny fraction. Could we not instead invest in excellent universal dementia care so that people could live dignified lives with dementia instead of saying, oops, mom can't track anymore, it's time to go. I, I think we're asking the wrong question. And I think that's one of the good things about this law is that if it gets us to ask the right questions by putting the wrong questions on the table, then I think we're actually advancing the conversation. Is there another question? Hello, thank you for your information today. Um, as a member of the, the public, I do appreciate the change in the framing of, of this from uh, physician-assisted suicide to death with dignity. Uh, and I also like the idea of having extra options on the table, that this would be an option available to me, even though I might not want to take it. I had two questions. One is, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about how the Netherlands and Switzerland differ from what we have here. And secondly, if we were to implement something like this here, are there any changes you would make to how um, the Oregon law is after you've seen how it's been implemented? Are there any changes that you would suggest that we might make? So by here you mean in the state of Arizona? Okay. Um, it would be a little bit hard for me to do that. Um, so you asked first about uh, some of the European countries, um, uh, but Netherlands, Belgium, and, and Switzerland, and so forth. Um, Again, context is very important. They are countries that have universal access to basic care. So some of the perverse, as we've heard discussed already, the perverse financial incentives that our system sets in play to, in some sense, disempower uh, patients from being able to make choices, those are not as present in, in, those, in those contexts. Um, uh, it is possible in, in the Netherlands for uh, 
you to, um, I mean, some of the provisions, the regulatory provisions or the safeguards are, are, are similar, but some of the ones that are uh, distinctively different, you can request a lethal injection from your physician. So the physician there is the direct agent or cause of, well, proximate agent, I, I guess, or cause, cause of your death. But physician assumes a greater responsibility because once you say yes, uh, if you, if you receive the, the pills, the prescribed pills, you can say, I'm going to put them away. And roughly two-thirds of the individuals do that in, in both states. Um, you uh, ask your physician to give you a lethal injection. I mean, there's no going back. That's an irrevocable and irreversible decision. Um, also, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the, uh, the laws in Oregon and Washington do not have any language in them, the statutes anyway, about uh, using this, uh, using the acts based on patient pain or suffering. It's all patient self-determination. And that's different in, in the Netherlands and Belgium. Patient suffering is taken into account. Um, how, how that's monitored, the, the Dutch, because you know, in part, this goes back to the nature of the relationship between physician and patient, and they've been journeying not only the death uh, period or the dying period, but also the life period with individuals. They tend to stay with their physicians much, much longer than we do in a very fragmented uh, system of care that we have. So uh, they're able to sort of see that this individual is sort of, you know, really in a state of distress, extreme pain, or suffering. And so those those make, if, uh, well, those are some, some of the substantial differences. Belgium, their parliament just passed a law earlier this, uh, in February, I believe it was, it was signed into law by their king that would allow for uh, euthanasia for disabled children. Um, this is where the disabilities issue becomes really, really salient. And again, they have to have a level of uh, suffering and, and so forth. And I have to say, I don't know the degree of, disability that, that we're talking about. I'm I just, okay, okay, so, so that's a different kind of context. Um, actually, I, I, your second question is a really good one, but let me just desist for right now and um, <laughs> you can talk about the well, I can try Belgian that one. context. So the, the, the issue at stake in the Netherlands and Belgium had to do with pediatric euthanasia. And um, there's some very interesting work that's going on, but there's a commission, the Groningen Commission, that has been following this over time and trying to understand what those standards would be. Um, and it, there's been a really interesting kind of evolution over time about what the level of devastation is, and that's kind of how they frame it. Um, and I have been privileged to hear reports at our bioethics meeting every year from this group, and they, um, they the stories that they tell are, are incredibly difficult, but these are essentially the kinds of, Ill, of, of conditions that um, are in a short period of time, a very long period of time of uh, exquisite suffering that is very difficult to control. So there's two different kinds. There's the kinds of kids that are born with neurologic devastation from which they will never advance. There is, there is no future difference for them. So they are in this state of being that is very hard to imagine because we can't. We can't communicate with these kids and, and they're never going to change. So um, you, could ex you could think of the extreme cases of, of a coma situation, for example, where they're never going to have consciousness. They're, they're never going to be aware of their surroundings. And their actual life expectancy can be quite variable. No one actually knows how long that might go on. Um, but the idea of quality of life that they themselves can experience is zero for the most part. Now, there are plenty of people that will argue that they still contribute to society and that they play a role and that other people can benefit from their presence on the planet, and that's one of the, the, the counter arguments about why we should not proceed because it, that's exactly the disability argument. But the other kind of, of cases are... Um, cases of congenital illness that just have this trajectory to death that is, is, is essentially like a burn victim, if you will, where 
every nerve in your body is sort of exposed and firing, and it's just exquisitely painful. Um, and there are the kinds of situations where there, the palliative options to actually keep these children comfortable almost move to the same level of sedation to the point where they can't really experience their world because their choices are pain or sedation, and there's not a lot in between. And the trajectory of the illness is not going to reverse in any way. It doesn't get better. If anything, it just gets worse. And so those, we're talking about very, very extreme kinds of cases, and um, there, is a, there is a deliberative process. These are not casual decisions that get made. There are lots of different people that are chiming in. There is a cadre of uh, neonatologists and pediatricians and specialists of all different kinds, neurological developmental psychologists, all kinds of people that that do this work with kids all the time to sort of render an opinion about the state of being of these individuals and their futures. Um, these are all rare cases. They don't happen a lot. But the idea, I think, goes to a broader question about what do we think of as the benefit of medicine? And, and there's, and again, in kind of the two different ways to frame this argument, we have the do no harm side of medicine that goes to the Hippocratic Oath, it's kind of the fundamental ancient um, code of ethics for the profession. And then so there are some people who say, well, do no harm means do not ever end someone's life. And there are others who say do no harm means do not let these painful lives continue if we can alleviate their suffering. And there are a handful, very small, I'm not advocating this, but it's a very small number of people for whom death may be one of the only ways to relieve their suffering. And I think it also is a, another paradox of medicine. The only reason why these kids are alive at all is because of medicine. And that if they were born in India, we wouldn't need to euthanize them because they wouldn't stand a chance. They just wouldn't make it in the world. Um, again, if we want to talk about justice, you know, we can talk about diarrheal disease taking out insane numbers of children all around the world. And we're not worried about that to the same level that we worry about these few cases in the Netherlands. So there's, there's lots of ways to frame this. Um, but I think the other difference is, um, and, and this is something that uh, we talked about, that, that the reason that the, the first law in Washington in 1990 did not pass was because it included euthanasia as one of the provisions. And that was the piece of the legislation that tanked the bill. Um, people were willing to engage with the notion of physician-assisted dying because the ultimate decision about whether you live or die is yours to make and no one else's. And I think that we are never in this society going to get to a place where euthanasia is going to be acceptable for the fact that we're a much bigger country um, than any of these European countries. Most of them would fit in the valley, I think is what you said, right? Most of, most of the European countries that we're talking about are smaller than the greater Phoenix area. So we could almost see these people that we're talking to. And we can hold people accountable in ways that we really can't in such a huge, diverse culture as the United States. That's one reason. I think the other reason is that, again, it's fixing the wrong problem. We're, we're really going about this. We have many, many things that we need to take on before we get to that point. And I don't think that we should be proposing euthanasia as the solution when there are so many other things that we must do first. I just wanted to make a little plug for the ways in which the Lincoln Center is extending these conversations. So Mark and I are the coaches of ASU's first Ethics Bowl team. Um, and one of the cases that our undergrad team will be debating is, well not debating, just analyzing, is um, whether, uh, whether this Belgian law that extends uh, euthanasia to children is ethically okay. Um, are there any other questions? Because we have a few more. Yes. I wanted to respond to that gentleman who was asking about the physician role in all this. And first of all, I, I liked your notion that, I, I, that medical specialty societies shouldn't weigh in for speaking for all surgeons or all internists. But I did want to just touch on a couple of bioethical principles that most of us in the hospice world pay attention to. 
And first of all, there's a major distinction between withholding or withdrawing care that might lead to a death or hasten death and actively providing something that we know will cause death. And so it doesn't do, mo most of us are perfectly fine to advise somebody don't undergo CPR or don't put this feeding tube in or don't start dialysis, but giving a lethal injection or a lethal dose. Is fine. Along those lines though, there's another uh, ethical principle, the so-called principle of double effect where if you prescribe a medication, and we know typically opioids, quote, narcotics or sedate, sedative medicines that may sedate people and suppress their respirations as a secondary effect of the pain relief or anxiety relief that might hasten death, you know, we can, we can quote, live with that, or that's sort of ethically justifiable versus, again, I give a dose that I know will actively end somebody's life more uh, imminently. And so, and that's, a, you know, that's gray and it's slippery slope at times. And, and you brought up the concept of palliative sedation, which is when the, the symptoms are so difficult to manage with usual doses. And these are often, you know, delirium or pain where you have to provide sufficient sedation that people are basically in a coma you know, they're not going to die right away, but then you're, you're not providing food and fluid and other things. It's usually a re reasonable death. Again, it qualifies as what we would most consider a dignified and good death over a little more prolonged period of time, usually hours, days, maybe a week or so. So those are at least some of the ethical aspects that we bring into this, and which again, as I, I agree with, you know, our attorney here that some of the, 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 the concepts of this law, um, you know, don't always align with. I have a, a quick question. We were talking about some of the ways in which um, the, the political and economic problems can be so entangled, and, and there are so many things that we would want to change about the system um, in order to promote good death in whatever ways. Is there, do you have suggestions for how we might, what changes we might make, maybe one specific change we might make in medical school pedagogy um, that would promote uh, good death? <laughs> Just one? <laughs> you can pick your top three. <laughs> um, I think the thing that we have, that we are starting to teach are uh, fundamental communication skills about eliciting a patient's narrative. So I'm just curious, when, how many of you have seen a doctor in the last year? How many of you have ever been asked by a doctor, what's important to you? Good, one. Okay, we have one, um, two. But these are, these are sort of fundamental questions, and again, they sort of rest on this assumption that we know what people want, and uh, we think that what they want is life at all cost. And so we don't, we don't train anybody to actually ask the questions of what does quality of life actually mean to you, and uh, what is actually important for you. So if we reframe the goals of medicine into um, what is it that we need to do medically to, to make the the mind, body, spiritual, emotional space for you to accomplish what you want to accomplish, then uh, we, might, we might offer all kinds of different things to people, and we might not offer a whole lot of things to people. And this is basically what palliative medicine is about, but there's no reason why we have to wait until you're dying to start asking those questions. So, so I think communication skills are absolutely important, and I think, um, the other thing that we don't do a very good job of is asking people to talk about the lived experience of illness. So um, you'll go in and they'll say, um, have you had any pain? Yes. What was your pain on a scale of 1 to 10? I got to tell you, I got asked that question weekly for about six months. And, and what you learn very quickly is what's the number that's going to get you the thing that you want? So if you want pain medications, you say 8. And if you don't really care, and pain is kind of not very important to you, and you want to make your oncologist really happy, then you say two. And it becomes sort of a farce. So 
It's not, and, and, and I gotta tell you, a two and a 10 sort of means something because they're far enough apart, but a seven and an eight don't mean anything. And nobody ever asks me, okay, you're in pain, how, how, how problematic is that for you, right? I'm in pain all the time. Is it a big deal? Sometimes, but not always. And nobody know, nobody's ever asked me that question. So I think we have to get people to think about what it's like to live in bodies that aren't perfect in ways that allow us to still be who we are as people and maintain our sense of self. When you look at some of the research about why people choose physician-assisted dying, it's because their illness has taken the things away from them that let them recognize themselves as themselves. So we talk about dignity, we talk about autonomy. Those are words. But as one woman said in our study, when I can't cook, when I can't shop, and when I can't paint, I don't really care if I'm still here. So we sort of then kind of teased her and I said, do you have to do all three? And she was like, well, yes and no, right? These aren't absolutes. So she didn't have to cook and clean and paint by herself all the time, but it was her way of expressing that these were the things that made her who she was. And you know, one of the other issues that makes it really tricky is about accommodation. So dying people lose things. That's what happens. Your life gets smaller when you're dying. You stop being able to do a lot of stuff. So you might keep redefining what that threshold is and what it really means to you. Um, but I think in her case it could be, it's not only that she could not shop, could not cook, could not paint, but her body was dying. And so her soul and all of it was kind of packing up and ready to go. And your comment about why do people ever need to do this at all, it's a really good question. We had people that took medications who were actively dying, that if they had done nothing, they would have been dead in two or three hours probably, and they still did it. And it's a very curious question, why did they bother? And I think they did for two reasons, because they, they were playing that movie and they wanted to make sure they did not want to have an, a, you know, a reverse moment and then come back and do this again. Another lady was a matriarch of a family and they had to rent a bowling alley at Thanksgiving because their family was so big. And what she said, she wasn't dying a horrible death, she was on hospice, she, was, she had cancer but it was just taking too long and she was exhausted. Dying can go on for a really long time. And as she said, I've said goodbye to all 63 members of my family. I don't want to do it twice. I'd rather go on a good day than go on a bad day. And I'd like to leave them with this legacy and memory of who I am as the matriarch of their family while I still have something to, to, that makes me who I am. So a lot of this stuff is really subtle and hospice isn't gonna change that because hospice isn't gonna speed it up, and some people are just done with dying. Sometimes it just takes a really long time. And we sort of, we ask the question, well, what if you just stop eating and drinking? Why do you need to take a bunch of pills? You know, you can do that anytime. You could do that right now. And they were like, yeah, but what's the point? It might take a week. And then my family has to sit around day after day wondering if I'm still gonna be here tomorrow. And they saw that as, uh, difficult and painful and useless and kind of silly exercise. Now the families didn't. The families were grateful to see them the next day and still see them there. But you can see there's, there's really these very, this is what I call the, the move from Kronos time to Kairos time. So Kronos is the time on the clock and Kairos time is that space that really doesn't change. So Albert Einstein is quoted with saying, you know, put your hand on a stove that's hot and you really think about it, but sit next to a pretty woman and the time goes by and you have no idea how long you spent there. So it, it really is moving into a very different kind of liminal space where the time and how it travels and unfolds for that lived experience isn't the same as on a clock on a schedule. And so some people need to speed that up and um, some families want to slow it down. So we heard also lots of negotiations where family members would say, no, I'm not ready. I need you to wait another week. And then sometimes they did. And sometimes in those cases, 
the family sort of intervened because they made the promise. You, you gave me another week, and now you're kind of in this space where you really can't really do it on your own. I mean, this is also, this is sort of, these are the stories that aren't getting told. This is what's really going on. So you might get your script, but physicians aren't at the bedside when they get taken, so we don't really know if the patients are taking them on their own or if they're getting some help. That might be going on. It probably is. So it might be a little of that don't ask, don't tell kind of zone. You know, let's set it up, let's go through the process, let's do due diligence, let's make sure this is sort of an agreeable process, but then people are kind of backing off. And so maybe there is some of that happening, but it's probably not happening months with a lot of, you know, overt participation by the public face of medicine. Um, everything that was just said, I, I agree with, and was going to emphasize as well, communication skills is, I mean, it's an issue for, for certainly all of us. We know from studies that uh, physicians tend to interrupt patients within 20 seconds of the patient starting to narrate their stories. Okay, well now we're down to 10. New study out. Okay. Anyway, uh, so. He's a doctor. He had to interrupt you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I only got five seconds that time. Anyway, so we know that the other thing that, so apart from that, which I totally endorse, is uh, it's part of the same puzzle, but I, I would like to see the medical profession take some leadership on, not only within the context of medical school, but within society, as to how we can best understand this concept we call death. That we've, this concept, there's a biological, physiological process that goes on, we've named it death, it's got all these kind of connotations that we're fearful of. Um, and this notion that medicine has tended to work with, hospice has a different metaphor, but medicine in the United States for a long time worked with the image of death as enemy. And when you sort of set up the social narrative in that way, then certain kinds of technological uh, life prolonging advances are gonna be part of that, that process. And we're gonna put a lot more money into curing cancer than we are going to into trying to find palliative care for cancer. So, you know, trying to reframe, you know, our uh, basic understandings. Of, and again, I, I think that's a social conversation we need to um, develop. Uh, hospice has a different understanding. Certain religious traditions have different understandings. But, um, uh, you know, if I could uh, I'd say that I'd like to have medical schools have their students take my course in death and dying. That would be my one suggestion. And on time. Ooh, we are, we are close. Yeah, I just, to add to that though, um, with medical students, I've shown that uh, Bill Moyer's film on dying and so forth, and it follows this palliative care physician around. Um, and every, if you show it to medical students, they just love this thing. They love the guy, they love the way that he treats the, the patients and so forth. But then you ask them how many of you are interested in going into palliative care. Nobody ever is interested. Uh, it's just, it's an interesting commentary. You know, I think there is kind of this mindset that the, the dying person there's, there's some kind of disconnect there that, that, you know, it's not a physician's role to care for the dying, that dying is really a part of life and I'm caring for this person at this stage kind of thing, so, you know. Jason, you want to say yes, a few? I, I want to, I um, to wrap things up because I, I promised that we'd be out of here at 8 p.m., uh, but I, I want to thank you all uh, for joining us this evening for the start of a conversation. And there's a lot more, obviously, to be said about the topics of physician aid in dying and end-of-life decision-making, hospice and palliative care, and, and palliative sedation, and just about everything else under the sun. Uh, so I'm grateful that you've joined us. I hope you'll join me in thanking our panelists, uh, Helene Starks and Courtney Campbell, for their participation, and Jenny Bryan and Mark Clark for their questions, but I also uh, hope you'll join me in thanking you for the nice questions that sparked our conversations this evening. And you can come harass them up here as much as you like. <laughs>